Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's foremost personalities, Martin Wolfson and Gertrude Warner, in an original radio drama titled Death Has a Thousand Faces. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call, Death Has a Thousand Faces. Our story begins at police headquarters in an eastern metropolis. In a small, shabbily furnished office, Horace Riker, a patrol officer for the State Prison Commission, is seated at his desk, which is completely covered with gift packages. As Horace, a small, mild-mannered man in his late 40s, starts to open some of the gifts, there's a knock at his door. Come in. Oh, hello, Captain. Hello, Horace. Well, I see none of the boys forgot you. Twenty-five years with the State Prison Commission. That's a long time. Yes, I I never knew I had so many friends. <laughs> Why, look at all these gifts. There must be at least 20. Well, here's another one, Horace. This is for me and the other boys in the Homicide Squad. Oh, I, I don't know how to thank you and the others, Captain. You've all been so kind. Ah, nonsense, Horace. You know how we all feel about you. I'm really a very lucky man, Captain. I have a job I like, fine friends, and a wonderful wife. Ah, so you and Millie are hitting it off okay, huh? Of course. I told you it would work out all right, even if I am 20 years older than Millie. Well, I'm glad to hear I was wrong. Here, let me help you open your gifts. Well, thanks, Captain. Well, looks as though half these gifts are boxes of cigars. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to take up smoking, Horace. <laughs> Guess you're right. Well, this one doesn't seem to be cigars. Sounds like a clock. Clock? Yes, I can hear ticking inside. Doesn't seem to be a card with it. Well, I'll unwrap it. The card is probably inside. Wait just a minute. Let me see that package. Why, of course. Here. Yeah, there's a ticking inside, all right. Cheap wrapping paper, no store label, return address. Why should anyone send you a wound-up clock? Well, maybe they just wound it up to make sure it works. I don't like the looks of this. Well, what do you mean? Mac, this is Captain Ross calling from Riker's office. Get the bomb disposal squad over here on the double. It's an emergency. <laughs> What, what did you find out, Captain? Morelli and the bomb disposal squad have just finished. It was a bomb, all right. Oh, dear me. Morelli said it was extremely well constructed. If you had opened that package, it would have been blown to bits. Who who could have sent it? Oh, it's pretty obvious. It must have been sent to you by one of the convicts whose parole you revoked. You, you really think that's it? Of course. I wonder which one it was. That's what we'd like to know. There's nothing about that bomb that we can trace. Well, you'll have to be doubly careful from now on. Doubly careful. Yes, this con may make another attempt on your life. I'm assigning one of my men to you for protection. But but I don't need protection, and think how frightened Millie would be if she found out. Now, don't you worry. She won't find out. I'll see to that. Well, if you think it's best... Just leave everything to me, Horace. Now, you better uh, run along home. Millie? Millie, where are you? Oh, here I am. Stop yelling. Look, Millie, at all the gifts I got from the men at the office. They... Isn't that a new dress you're wearing, darling? Yes, I bought it this afternoon. How do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful. You look wonderful in it, Millie. Uh, how, how much did it cost? Eighty dollars. Eighty dollars? Yes. It was marked down from a hundred. I just couldn't resist it. But, Millie, you bought two new dresses just last week. Well, you can't expect me to go around in rags. I'm sick and tired of having to skimp all the time and never No, have... no, 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 Millie. If you want to keep the dress, of course you may. The only thing is I, I, I don't know how I'll be able to meet the insurance payment due this week. You mean if I keep this dress, 
You won't be able to make the payment on your policy? Yes, dear. Oh. Well, in that case, I'll return it. You must keep up your insurance. I, I'm sorry, darling, that you have to return it. I, I, I'll, I'll try to find a part-time job in the evenings so we can increase our income. You're going to have everything you want. Yes, Horace, you're right. I am going to have everything I want. One way or another. That night, as Horace took Millie out to a movie, they were followed by a detective who Captain Ross had assigned to guard Horace. But as the days slipped by, Horace went about his work as usual, completely disregarding his bodyguard. After three weeks had passed, and no further attempts were made on Horace's life, the detective was assigned to another case. Good evening, darling. Sure was hot today, wasn't it? Yes. Supper will be ready in a few minutes. All right, dear. Is there any beer in the refrigerator? Yes, I put two bottles in there this morning. Good. Nothing better than cold beer on a hot day. You want some beer, Millie? Now, you know I never drink it. It's too fattening. What did you do today, dear? Uh, what did I do? Well, I, I, I went shopping. Oh. Oh, this beer is cold. It makes my eyes ache. Horace, I can't stand this heat much longer. When are you getting your vacation? Well, I've been given the second and third weeks in September. But that's weeks away. I know, Millie, but I didn't have any choice. I'm sorry that we... Oh. Oh. What's wrong? My heart. It hurts. That's what comes from drinking beer when you're overheating. Oh, it feels worse. Oh, nonsense. You'll be all right in a minute. M Millie, help me. Get a doctor. I, I can't breathe. Horace, are you sure you need a doctor? Yes. Hurry, Millie. Hurry. How is he, Doctor? That was a close call, Mrs. Riker. But he'll be all right. You can go in now. Oh, thank you. Doctor, I'm Captain Ross, friend of Mr. Riker's. Oh, how do you do, Captain? Millie, uh, that is, Mrs. Riker, said it was a heart attack. Is that right? Yes, Captain, it was a heart attack. Brought on by poison. Poison? Yes. Do you have any idea how it happened? Yes. Strychnine in the beer. Fortunately for Riker, he only took a sip of the beer. Had he taken any more, he'd be dead. This is a matter for your department, Captain. Yes, yeah, so it seems. I'll uh, turn in a report to you. Thank you, Doctor. That's quite all right. Well, I've got to leave now. I've got another patient to see. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Strychnine. Has the doctor left? Yes. How's Horace? Oh, he's asleep now. That beer that Horace drank, when did you get it? Oh, it was delivered yesterday from the grocery. Did the delivery boy give it to you directly? Why, no. He left it on the rear porch. I was out all day. I see. What are you getting at? Horace's heart attack was caused by poison. Poison in the bottle of beer. Poison? Mm-hmm. Who would want to poison Horace? Oh, maybe it was one of the convicts whose parole he revoked. Then again, it might be someone else. You have no clue? No, not yet. But I can promise you one thing. I'll not give up until I've got the person who's trying to murder Horace. <laughs> How are you? I'm feeling fine, Captain. It's good to be back at work. Well, sit down, Horace. Thank you. I suppose you realize what a close shave you had. Yes. Horace, I've got four men working on the case day and night. We've been checking on all the convicts whose paroles you revoked. Well, that sounds like quite a job. It is. Naturally, we've been uh, checking other angles as well. Other angles? Yes. Uh, you understand, of course, it's my duty to investigate every... Every aspect of the case. Certainly, Captain. There's nothing personal in what I'm doing. It's, it all comes under routine investigation. Yes, of course. But what I'm trying to say, Horace, is... I've had one of my men check up on your wife. On Millie? That's right. But, but that's ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. You have no right to... It isn't to... ridiculous. We've uncovered some very interesting facts about your wife. What? what? These are the facts. First, your wife worked in an aviation instrument factory during the war. 
She's a skilled mechanic. Of course, I know that. It's absurd. Your you wife has the ability to construct a bomb. A bomb such as the one you received. Are you... Are you trying to say it's Millie who's out to murder me? Let me give you the rest of the facts. You're out of your mind. How, how dare you make such an accusation against my wife? How dare you? Fact number two. Six months ago, you took out $50,000 worth of insurance on your life. Whose idea was that? It... How can you possibly afford to carry $50,000 worth of insurance on your salary? That's none of your business. I refuse to listen any further to these absurd accusations you're making against my wife. Fact number three. Your wife is two-timing you. Has been for months. She's seeing a young man by the name of Jerry Clapper. I won't take that from anyone, not even you. I'll show you. No, don't be a fool, Horace. I'm only doing my duty. Now sit down. Sit down. And stay down. Horace... We've been friends for 20 years. Do you think I'd tell you all this if I didn't have to? It's lies. All lies. Fact number four. Your wife's boyfriend works for a medical firm. He has easy access to poisons, including strychnine. Nothing you're saying is true. Nothing. If you were honest, you'd admit that you don't like Millie. You never have. You were dead set against my marrying That's her. That's true, but that has nothing to do with this. I love my wife and I trust her. I don't believe a word you've told me. If you knew her as I do, you'd know she isn't capable of such a thing. Are you so hopelessly in love with her that you can't see what I'm telling you is the truth? It isn't the truth. And nothing you can say will change my mind. And I warn you, Captain, if you spread any of these lies about my wife around, I'll... I'll kill you. With this threat, Horace stormed out of Captain Ross's office and returned to his own. In the days that followed, he avoided Ross, which was soon noticed by his fellow workers. Horace told Millie nothing of the accusations that Ross had made. If anything, he was twice as devoted to Millie as ever. The two spent long hours together making plans for their vacation. The day before they were to leave, Horace was summoned to Captain Ross. You wanted to see me? Yes, have a seat. I prefer to stand. Very well. I understand you're leaving on your vacation tomorrow. Yes. Where are you going? None of your business. I'm asking you as your superior. We may wish to get in touch with you. We're driving to Virginia. We're renting the same cottage we had last year. I see. Have you had any further attempts made on your life? No. While you're on your vacation, be careful. What do you mean by that? You know what I mean. You don't stop insinuating that my wife is trying to murder me. I'll see to it Just that you... Just be careful. That's all I'm asking. I'd like to see you come back. Is there anything else? No. Thank you. Well, I've warned him. This is a life lying peacefully in a hammock far away from everything and everyone. Enjoying yourself, Millie? Yes, Horace. Just like our honeymoon, isn't it? Yes. And we've done all the same things. We've gone fishing, swimming, boating, and we've tramped all over the countryside. It's been wonderful. You know, the only thing we haven't done that we did last year is visit the gigantic caverns. Yes, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. We did visit the gigantic caverns last year, didn't we? Yes, Horace. Why don't we spend tomorrow exploring the caverns? Do you remember that wonderful waterfall and pool? Yes, it'll be a lot of fun. Do you remember the way we almost got lost in the caverns last year? Oh, if you get lost in there, you can wander days without finding your way out. Well, this time I'm going to be very careful. Yes, Horace. We've got too much to live for to let anything happen to us. <laughs> Well, here's the entrance to the caverns, Millie. It certainly is deserted, isn't it? Yes, no one comes here after Labor Day. Now, wait till I tie the end of the string to this tree. Uh, how long is that ball of string? Oh, about 5,000 feet, almost a mile. There. That should be long enough to take us to the waterfall and the pool and the cavern, shouldn't it? Yes, just about. Are you ready, dear? Yes, Horace. I'll carry the flashlight. Your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness in just a minute. 
cool in here, isn't it? Yes. The only thing I don't like about these caverns are the rats running around. And the bats. Oh, they won't bother you. Uh, do you want me to unwind the ball of string for you? No, Millie, I can manage nicely. This place is fascinating. I'm certainly glad you suggested this little trip there. Business cavern. Why, must be 200 feet. Yes, these caverns get more interesting as you pass from one to another. However, I'm afraid we can't go much further. We've about reached the end of the string. But, Horace, I wanted to see the waterfall and the pool. Oh, I should have brought along another ball of string. Why are you stopping? I, I've reached the end of the string. Horace, listen a moment. You hear the waterfall? Yes, I, I think I do. It sounds as though it's directly ahead. Let's keep going a little further. But, darling, there isn't any more string. Oh, we'll only go a little way. It doesn't sound very far off. We'll be able to find our way back. Well, all right. Wait till I tie the end of the string around this rock. There. Come along. <laughs> We've come quite a way, but here it is. Yes. Shine your flashlight down on the pool, Horace. All right. It must be quite deep. Yes. What are you thinking of, darling? If a person fell into the pool, there'd be no way to get out. The walls of the pool are sheer rock. There'd be no way of climbing up them. Yes, that's right. What makes you think of it, darling? I don't know. Standing here or looking down at the pool, it just comes to mind. It couldn't be that perhaps you want to get rid of me. Oh, Horace, how can you say such a thing? It could be, couldn't it? After all, I'm 20 years older than you. I, I'm not good looking and I haven't any money. Oh, don't talk like that. Why not? It's true, isn't it? My, my friend Captain Ross thinks it's you who's made the two attempts on my life. I? Yes. Ross said that you could have constructed the bomb that was sent to me and have poisoned the beer I drank. How dare he say such a thing? He, he claims you're after my insurance. And, of course, he mentioned the man you've been seeing, Jerry Clapper. He, he told you about Jerry? Yes. Or if you don't believe that I sent you that bomb or poisoned the beer, do you? No, Millie. I know you didn't. Oh, it's good of you not to think so. You may want me dead, Millie, but I know it wasn't you who made the attempts on my life. How can you be so sure? It's very simple, Millie. Because it was I who sent the bomb to myself and poisoned the beer. You? Yes. But why? Why? You're in love, Millie. You should know to what lengths love can drive a person. In that horrible moment seven months ago when I found out you were deceiving me, I came close to killing you. Horace! Does it surprise you that a mild little man my age could feel so deeply? But then I realized that wasn't the way. That wasn't the way? No. I began to formulate a plan, a very clever plan. First, I took out a $50,000 life insurance policy with you as beneficiary. Several months later, I followed that up by sending myself a bomb, and shortly afterwards, I poisoned my beer. But why, why did you do all that? I, I knew that sooner or later, my friend Captain Ross would come to believe that it was you who was attempting to kill me. And that's exactly what happened. But why? Why? It was all part of the perfect build-up. The build-up that had led to this moment. What? Yes, Millie. You're going to die. Here and now. No, Horace. No. I loved you so, Millie. I loved you so. Horace, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Where 
Yes, Jerry. Let him save you. I wasn't good enough for you, was I? But you need me now, don't you? Horace! Help me! Help me! <laughs> Millie? She's gone. I... I better get out of here. As soon as I get back to the cottage, I'll, I'll call the sheriff and tell him my story. He'll believe it, particularly after he talks to Captain Ross. There won't be any trouble. After all, I'm just a mild little man in his late 40s. I'm not the type who can love deeply or hate deeply. Well, at least she found out before she died. Now, let, let's see. Here are three paths. Which one is it that will lead me to the string? It's the one on the left. Yes, that must be it. It's about a half mile from here to where the string ran out. Then I follow the string for a mile and I'll be at the entrance. Strange, I... I don't remember this turn in the path. But then I may not have noticed it before. This must be the right path. But then they all look so much alike. These caverns are just a maze of passageways. Maybe I took the wrong path. But perhaps I should have taken the middle one. Yes. Yes, it must be the middle one. I'd better retrace my steps. All I have to do is keep calm and I'll, I'll be all right. People only get lost when they're excited. I just have to go back to where the three paths are and take the middle one. I mustn't get excited. I mustn't get excited. Horace Stryker ignored the rapid beating of his heart and attempted to remain calm. But as he made his way along, he was constantly confronted with diverging and crisscrossing passages, all of which looked unfamiliar. After wandering for an hour, his flashlight burned out and he could no longer go on. Exhausted, he sank down to the ground, completely losing all track of time. Meanwhile, the absence of the Rikers from their cottage went unnoticed. It was only after the fifth day that it was discovered they were missing. The countryside was searched without any success. Captain Ross flew to Virginia to aid in the search. Then, someone remembered the gigantic cavern. A week from the day he'd entered the caverns, Horace Riker was found, semi-conscious, babbling deliriously. He was rushed to a hospital, but the search for his wife went on. You may go in now, Captain Ross. Thank you, nurse. Hello, Horace. How are you feeling? Captain Ross, what are you doing here? I flew down here two days ago to help in the search. I was with the party that found you in the gigantic caverns. Millie... Did you find her? Yes. How is she? She's dead. Dead? They found her body in a large pool by a waterfall. Poor Millie. Suppose, Horace, you tell me exactly what happened. The whole idea of visiting the gigantic caverns was Millie's. Uh, when we got to the entrance, I led the way in, while Millie unrolled the ball of string behind me. After we'd gone a mile, the string ran out, in the distance, we could hear a waterfall. Millie insisted that we go on, though I argued it was dangerous. What did she say to that? She said she'd mark the path with her lipstick as we went along, and we could find our way back to the string that way. I see. We must have gone about a quarter of a mile when I suddenly realized Millie was no longer following me. I turned, but she was gone. Then I called out to her. I could hear her laughing in the distance and telling me to find my own way out. What did you do then? I'm afraid I got panicky. In that moment, I realized everything you told me was true. I tried to follow Millie's laughter, but it seemed to come from all directions. As I tried to retrace my steps to the string, I became completely lost. And that's all I remember. I see. Despite the lipstick marks she made as a trail, Millie apparently became lost when she ran away from you. Yes. Captain, I want to apologize for not having believed you. I hope there aren't any hard feelings. None at all, Horace. 
I'm just glad I was one of the party who found you before it was too late. I suppose I was in a bad way when you found me. Mm -hmm. You were semi-conscious, slowly sinking. By the way, Horace, uh, this will interest you. Oh, well, what's that? It's a phonograph recording. I'll play it for you. I had it made just after you were brought to this hospital. Listen. No, I wasn't good enough for you, was I? Why, that's me. I've got to find my way out of here. Do you think that all these months I haven't known what's been going on, eh? I may not be young or good-looking like your Jerry, but I have brains. So dark here. It took brains to work all this out. First the insurance, then the bomb, and poison beer. And now this, Millie, just the way I planned it. You're drowning, Millie. You're drowning. And they'll never find out, Millie. I'm too clever for them. Yes, Horace, you are clever. I must apologize. I completely underestimated you. If you hadn't been delirious when we found you, I'd never have known that you murdered Millie. perfect blueprint for murder. Only he left no margin forever. How was he to know that he would confess all while delirious? That's the trouble with murder. It so often backfires and so fatally. Now, I recall another case in which the central character was too clever to engage in anything as vulgar as murder. Instead, he hired a famous voodoo witch doctor who had the ability to... Oh, you have to get off now. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Martin Wolfson, Gertrude Warner, and Wendell Holmes. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. Sound by George Cooney, broadcast engineer Al King. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. And now here's Maurice Toplin, The Mysterious Traveler. Listen next week to my tale titled... Hide out for a friend. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. Here's an announcement of interest to listeners of this program. Mysterious Traveler comic books are now available at newsstands everywhere. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>